Hello, I'm Mark Sumner, host of the Channel Chat Podcast Show, and today I have the pleasure of Oren Cropper, the CEO of NetSura, in the studio. In fact, not just in the studio, flown over from New York City. How are we doing, Oren? Fantastic. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming in. And also, as I just mentioned, a bit off air, you are the first South African guest in the studio as well so we are making new new things all the time in this on this show but i want to sort of go back to the start because Orin, when i look at um a guest when they come in i normally look through their linkedin profile have a scour around to see if i can think anything find anything interesting and i looked around first of all and i thought okay orin has got a quite a classical background he's worked at, at university sorry, he went to university he's got this information and economics degree but my research has found out that this go back before that you actually got expelled from school so tell the listeners this story how did you even get to university yes no i was um yeah i was definitely a, a bit of a problem child um i mean the first school i got expelled from the, the the recommendation was that i go to an old boys school i was spending too much time with the girls uh too young and uh you know so that was the one thing and then i did go to an old boys school called dallas college and uh i did uh appropriate a whole lot of gardening equipment because i felt we needed it for our gang um and uh so that was a an old boys catholic school so yeah they were i was just i was really i think i was hyperactive i was very naughty and then the final school i actually went to um uh, which is King Edwards, I uh, I was in boarding school and I think that just helped sort of stabilize me. Uh, it was very, very strict, very disciplined, you know, and that's really, I think, what I needed. So, yeah, I'm, st- I'm still involved with that school today and deeply grateful for the trajectory that it's put me on in my life. Fantastic. And then, th- so let's bring it up today with the, the university. What made you choose information systems and economics? Yeah, so I, I did a general BCom to start. I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. And then um, I was doing various things to pay for my studies. I was working as a waiter. Um, uh, we, uh, we threw open parties, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, a friend of mine uh, invited me to come. And oh, then, so then I thought to myself, okay, I was a bit disappointed because I thought in matric and sort of leading up to university that university was going to, they were going to want to know what you thought and it was going to be this huge intellectual experience. And all I really felt was they wanted me to regurgitate what was in the textbook. And uh, so if you were doing relatively well, you could take an extra major at no cost. And so I took information systems. And suddenly now I had a subject where it really felt like they wanted to know how I thought. Uh, and it felt like I was really being challenged. Not that I was academically gifted or anything. I don't mean it in that way, but it was more thinking and, and application than just regurgitating. And then uh, a friend of mine at the time who'd already been selling engineering calculators, he did, a, he did an engineering degree and computers to friends and family and engineering students invited me to come and sell for them. And that's how that journey started. So I started selling computers um, for them. That was in 1995. Um, and then pretty much since 97 is what I've done full time. So would you say it's by luck you sort of started interested in this career or, how, you know, what, what's your view on it? Oh, definitely. I think there's a whole lot of, a whole lot of luck, uh, in this journey, uh, that I've traveled. I mean, even ending up, even ending up, uh, buying a business in New York in 2016, there was, there was a whole lot of, uh, inorga- or organic uh, things that happened that resulted in us buying a business in New York, uh, me getting into this industry. Because to be honest, I, 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 I don't even think I'm, well, I don't think, I know I wasn't technically gifted in any way. I was more of a salesperson and sort of gravitated towards a strategy and culture piece pretty early on. Um, so a lot of, a, a lot of luck on this. On this. Were you even interested in IT? Was that so? Yes. You were? Yeah, I, I, I was, I mean, I was interested, but I don't, can't tell you like I got this computer when I was 12 and I was like building it. I didn't do any of that. It just sort of seemed like an interesting subject to take and I took it and I did okay. But I mean, even in the programming exams we did, we generally had five hour exams. Like the really bright guys were down in 20 minutes. 
uh, I was I was done in five hours, you know, <laughs> and still didn't necessarily uh, ace the exam. So I don't I don't I don't think I had any sort of serious technical aptitude. And to be honest, even in school and and through my studies, I wasn't really amazing at anything. Uh, and and that kind of, uh, in a way, became something that was became a superpower for me. That I realized, look, you're not naturally gifted at anything. You've got to be focused and really work hard if you're going to succeed. And then I suddenly found strength and confidence and comfort in that. Um, yeah, so a lot of luck through through my journey. Yeah. And let, let's talk about the journey with NetSir. How, how did the idea come up? How did sure. the actual company start? Yeah, sure. Um, so initially it was just selling computers and uh, to to friends and family, then it migrated to doctors. And uh, and then from from there we started connecting networks and uh, and then from there we started moving towards businesses. And the, and the name of the company in the beginning was MQS, which stood for Micropon Systems. We applied for six names and they all got rejected. And then we applied for another six. So this was the ninth name <laughs> yeah, that we applied for. It didn't really have any meaning. It just, we thought it sounded cool. Um, my girlfriend at the time designed the logo for free, uh, you know, so, and, and, and then, you know, we, we went into 98, 99, we started seeing that there was this, this entrepreneurial engine in, in, in the economy that didn't really have a reliable way to partner with a company, to to have their IT needs taken care of, have their businesses really enabled through technology. Uh, a lot of the technology at the time was built for larger enterprises, so there was a mismatch there. And I think there were, there's a relative amount of, um, I mean, a small, business, small entrepreneurial business, IT is not their core business, so they don't understand it in detail. So I think they were being taken advantage of. And then in the lead up to Y2K, we could clearly see that this was being exploited. So we that's kind of for me when the purpose started to really sink in. It was an opportunity to build a, a truly um, a values-driven, purpose-driven business that looks after small and medium enterprise technology needs in an honest, transparent way. And then we, the one disconnect we saw is that the more problems there were in their business, the more we made. And that was a disconnect. So we came up with almost like an insurance offering. We, we, we did want the name netsurance.com, but it was taken to end up with netsured. And it was the idea of a network support insurance offering. So the way it worked in the beginning was if you were paying, let's say, uh, a, thousand, a, a thousand pounds a month, okay, for us to look after you, and that was 12,000 pounds in a year. If you didn't use all the time, hypothetically, you only used, we had a time and time uh, reconciliation in the back end so if you were taking our recommendations keeping the quality of your environment up to speed we would allocate less time you'd have less problems so hypothetically you only used eight thousand pounds the other four thousand we would reimburse in three parts back one third back to the the customer one third to the the designated technician that looked after that environment one third to net shirt that's where the net shirt uh name, name came from and um yeah you know, so that's kind of that was the, the the really how the business began and that's quite innovative at that point i, don't, I haven't heard any of the, any msps doing that sort of thing so how, how did you come up with the idea well actually there was a, a a medical aid company in south africa at the time called discovery discovery health and uh, they had pioneered that idea of reimbursing you on your medical aid if you were healthy so if you if you go for for annual checkups, if you exercise, uh, today they're I mean they're here in the UK. They're they've been very very successful, and uh, I really thought uh, that would be a great idea. And I remember emailing the CEO in those days saying, Adrian, we're the discovery of the IT industry. Uh, I want to meet with you, tell you all about our business. He then referred me to someone on his advisory board, and within three months they became our, our biggest managed services customer uh that we ever had um so that's kind of where it came from and it just made sense because if you're going to be a good medical aid member and you're going to be healthy you're going to cost the company less and the same dynamic if you're going to be one of our customers if you're in a good place your network and your it is in a good place you're going to have less downtime we're going to have less uh frustrations and everybody's going to win 
One of the um, topics that I wanted to ask you about when I started reading about your background was the culture yep. of your company. And I started doing a bit of digging around and I saw around this, uh, the Dreams program. So tell the listeners about your culture because it has been at the forefront of your growth and the people that you attract, et cetera. So tell, tell what's, what, you ask, what is the Dreams program? Yeah, sure. So our purpose is supporting the dreams of the doers and that sort of articulation and, and deciding that happened in 2010 um, and the realizing that there is a need for a culture that encourages people not only to do great work but to actually lead a balanced life those seeds were planted 2003 2004 so i definitely didn't have a balanced life in the early days of the business and um and i think there's a time in anybody's career where you probably head down and working harder than 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 is sustainable and I definitely had that, and um, so it was in 2004 that one of our one of our top, one of our key engineers, who's actually in our team in New York to this day, he's been with us for over 20 years. Um, he had a burnout. He was sitting in front of a server. I got a call saying Sean is Sean's sitting in front of the computer. He's not typing. He's not talking, and he's not responding when we ask. Him. Well, like, literally like a breakdown, so full on breakdown. Wow. And um, so I realized that a lot of these guys is their passion. They love IT. They're going to go home and tinker around anyway. How do we bring the idea of balance uh, into our culture? Not only as, as, as something we encourage, but actually make it part of the line management function and part of the DNA of the business. Um, so I tried to launch a program at the time based on a journey, life journaling tool called Map for Life, which looks, if you look at a printer, it looks like a Bible. It's so thick. Look, the guy that wrote it is the engineer at a, at a past. His name's Glenn McGuirk. So it's basically the mass and size of achieving your goals and dreams. I tried to launch it in, uh, with an insured in 2005. It just didn't take. And then in 2007, I attended a program at MIT where Cameron Herald, one of the lecturers, mentioned a book by Matthew Kelly called The Dream Manager. And this was a real story about a janitorial services business in the U.S. called Jankoa that had unbelievably high staff turnover and how they turned this around by bringing the idea that you can achieve your personal life's uh, balance and goals and dreams whilst doing truly great work. And then I read a series of other books, Jim Miller and Tony Schwartz's book, The Powerful Engagement, that also profiled uh, an exec that had burnt out. Um, and, then, and then I did a program at Stanford where Simon Sinek facilitated our group. And, and he's the, the, talking about his concept, Start With Why. Yeah. So we launched the Dreams program in 2008, um, and now we had a programmatized structure of putting this idea that you, as, as the person, is the most important asset in your life, and the best way you can be there in your career, being a, a father or a mother, a husband or a wife, or whatever the important relationships are, is, is to make sure you're looking after yourself. So whether that's, you'll find health, you'll find fitness, you'll find uh meditation different people have different things yeah and so we we what we did is we focused on the visualization of it so there's a process that we flow for the dreams program where it kind of starts with the wheel of life the eight spokes rate yourself out of 10 and this is a common methodology how are you doing physical health family spiritual charity whatever it might be and then and then brainstorm per spoke as if there were no limits what would you like to achieve in that part of your life there are no limits no financial limits no time limits no age limits um you might end up with a hundred goals and dreams you know and uh and then you it takes you a process to prioritize down to your top 25 it forces you to choose two from each spoke so 16 then a further nine you can take from anywhere and then it brings you down to your top 10 and then that visualized, your top 10 goals and dreams visualized is what we call a dream book. That's a PowerPoint deck, your top 10 personal goals and dreams visualized. So if you look in our team's folder, you'll see about just over 300 goals and dreams from the last, last year, 300 uh, dream books. So you can go and see anybody's dream book. So it's part of the DNA. So we think it should live in the line management relationship. So if, if you were line managing me, we think every line manager should know and understand what their people really want in their lives. Not to pry, you know, but just like that's, that's, that's good connectedness in an organization. And we also believe there's an opportunity for the way you interact and connect to, to, to be based on an open and vulnerable, authentic 
thinking like this. Um, you know, so that's why nature is not for everybody because some people don't think like that. And it's they have very, you know, like I remember this one customer of ours, we just, we, we lead with this in our sales, in our M&A, in our recruitment, we lead with this. So if there's a blank look on their eyes, <laughs> we know it's a warning sign. I remember this one guy said to me, listen, Aaron, if you, if you present, if you show this to my CEO and he rolls it out, I will personally make sure you guys get fired. <laughs> you know? Well, you go and look on Glassdoor. If you search Glassdoor or Nurture Glassdoor, you'll see it says, ah, oh, this dreams program. They said it was optional. It's more like a cult. And that's okay. If it doesn't fit in your bright spot, it's not for everybody. But if it does, it brings a layer and, and, a, and a depth of meaning to your work day and your work life that I think is unbelievably powerful. Um, because for us, the purpose supporting the dreams of the doers, the epicenter, that is our people first. The next concentric circle around that is our customers. Because we know if we can find and keep great people, we're going to be able to do great things for our customers. Um, so that's the way that, that we balance it. So we've programmatized that you get, you do a dream book once a year, you get put in a dream group, where it's six to eight people, six, some, of, some of the groups as big as 12, you meet once a month and you check in and you get to know a lot about each other. Uh, we do a thing called a Dream Connect where you meet like this. So like I did, we've got a team, we've got a team in Poland as well. I've done Dream Connect with some of the guys in our Poland team. We've got a lady in our marketing team in Peru. There's people I don't see on a day-to-day -day basis. Now I'm connecting with them like in a real and authentic way that just brings a level of glue which i believe is the single greatest opportunity we have to protect the magic of what we're doing at the speed at which we're growing as a donor and as a founder do you take feedback negatively if something you mentioned there you said you know some people like to say it's a cold some people like yeah. to say it's not for you when you when you get feedback like that, do you take it personally do you think oh actually you know i'm trying to create this for the people and they're not they're giving me past feedback no, it's, I, I, of course, yeah, you know, I take it, I take it, yeah, I, I almost can't understand the cynicism sometimes, like some, I remember the first acquisition we did in New York in 2016, they thought this was a tool to manipulate them, <laughs> and so, like, they really genuinely thought that, yeah. like, we have, out of those, we have, there was over 20 people, we have one staff member left, so we made every mistake you could imagine in that deal, yeah. and, and, and the debate we have, because we're bringing these experts, like, who've got doctorates in, you know, organizational psychology and so forth and that. And they're saying, no, don't make it, don't force it. Make it totally op optional. And I'm just like, so if in the recruitment process I say to you, understand this, if this doesn't resonate, don't join us. Uh -huh. You know, because it's like, it's, it, you're going to miss a massive opportunity to connect here. So rather than go somewhere else, you know. So for me, it's a constant debate. You know, the real, the real, so organizational psychologists, psychiatrists, and people who understand this thinking say it shouldn't be as encouraged. And it's not forced. We definitely allow people not to participate. But I just think our purpose is supporting the dreams of the doers. That's our purpose. The epicenter of that purpose is our culture. So if it doesn't resonate, don't join us. That's my thinking, you know. So it's a constant uh, debate uh, mm -hmm. and uh, thing for me internally so yeah i do take i do take offense but i get over it pretty quickly i'm pretty thick skinned with the same time so to, talking about m a activity when you target a new a new client like a new a new company maybe you've met the the owner if they don't resonate with this 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 dream program do you potentially still go ahead or how, how do you sort of target these at least sort of activities yeah. because there's one thing building the culture internally there's one thing, having a target and thinking, you're now going to be part of my yeah. culture. So how do you integrate yeah. it? How do you target them? Look, I mean, we're reaching a point quite soon where more people are in the business and through acquisitions than we hired, which is a whole other dynamic. Wow. And um, so the gist of it is, what did we do wrong in 2016? We were arrogant. When we bought that business in Brooklyn, we thought we had all the answers and I think we forced things on them. And... The truth is, these MSPs have built something very special, and there's a magic there. So now our thinking is, as we re we leaned heavily into the M&A again late 2020, and, uh, and in discussions with Brian, uh, my partner, I said, 
we're not going to make this mistake again. So what we want to do is, and that's one of the reasons why we want to keep the key leaders. Because I think there's a whole, there's a whole web of DNA of what you're acquiring that's connected to those key leaders. So we, it, number one, if they don't, if the key leaders don't want to stay, we don't want to do the deal. Okay. So we walk away. So if, sorry, to, to, just to reassure that, if the, if the leader doesn't want to stay, he wants an exit, you just walk out. Yeah, it's, it's not for us. It's not a fit for us. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so we want to protect the magic of what's there. And it's almost the purpose of supporting the dreams of the doers must resonate. And the dreams program is more of a hug than a, than a shift and a change. We want to protect some of the rituals and the cool stuff they do already. We don't want to change that. We don't want to lose that because that's part of what makes, that's what's made them successful. That's part of what's kept their great people there. So I think, you know, when I say I want to protect our cultures and grow, it's more of that's protect is evolve. It has to evolve. Because if we think we're going to come in and just force this thinking on everybody, then we will fail. So it's, it's kind of in that book, Scaling Up Excellence, they talk about, you know, this idea of preserve the core and, sort of, but allow for innovation. And they kind of use the terms Buddhism versus Catholicism, where Catholicism is more prescriptive, Buddhism is more generalist. So we're trying to protect the magic of these businesses that are joining us. Once you get to as big as you are, 380 people, $47,000 worth of revenue, there's more There's more team members that are for our acquisition that you've actually recruited. Yes. How do you now sustain the growth and actually make sure that the culture is going to be maintained? Because I'm looking at companies where you've mentioned you're getting more acquisitions now and you're, you're still looking at acquisitions. Yeah. Is the culture potentially going to shift or do you still, how do you instill those core values that it still, it still means, you know, net sure IT is going to be, sorry, net sure it is going to be continuing to grow and be sustainable? Yes. Yeah, this is, the, this is, I think, the biggest challenge we have from ahead of us. And, um, you know, I suppose when we came up with the purpose supporting the dreams of the doers, the the, the the core focus of that was was our people and how do we really lean into a purpose that puts people front and center. And the next concentric circle around that was customers. I didn't conceive, but we didn't conceive that purpose to be successful in an M&A strategy. That was never our thinking. And what has transpired is these MSP entrepreneurs that are some gifted, very bright, inspirational people okay it's resonated with them because they have traveled this journey themselves and they want to find a home for their people where they're going to be looked after and they're going to be cared for and uh, they in turn where MSPs are want, these entrepreneurs are wanting to stay on they too want to know that they're going to be in a culture that cares for their people so um it's definitely part of what are drawing uh, these 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 uh, opportunities to us, and I think it's something we're going to continue to invest in. I don't, to be honest, I don't have all the answers on how we're going to protect us. Right now, we're getting it right. Uh, I think one of the biggest things that we can do to to protect us and protect the quality of being part of the nature team and family and being part and being serviced by us is making the right decisions around the acquisitions we do and doing our best to ensure that the fit at a high level is there, um, that the values and the culture do fit. And if they don't, walking away. So like I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with an illustrated, with an example. Met an amazing entrepreneur, a life sciences business folk in Massachusetts. And um, I, I presented my dream book in one of the meetings. Um, and one of our advisory board members was in the meeting and I got the sense it fell flat, <laughs> you know, I really, I really did. So, so, so we, so we, um, I mean, just a great inter opportunity, great business, but I just, that was the prime reason for me. If he didn't, if it didn't resonate with him as the founder and leader then. So, so what happened was about two weeks after we went through a process, we looked at the numbers, digesting it. So then I met with him and I told him. Uh, we decided this is not a fit for us, okay? And it was a short meeting. And he's, an, he's a, a New Yorker. He's thick-skinned, hardcore guy, but really an amazing human. And um, I couldn't believe how disappointed he was. I'll be honest. I was very surprised. I mean, he take it personally, like... Yeah, he was, yeah. he was very... 
And so anyway, we didn't, we didn't really have enough time to, 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 to sort of get into it. Then he sent me a long, well-considered email saying, Aaron, I just, I don't feel like I really heard the real reason here. And um, so in it, like Judd and Cal and somebody's different. So, so I did a Loom video and I just said to him, and I laid it out, I said to him, honestly, the single biggest thing is the, the culture. That's the biggest. So then there were two or three other smaller things. And, um, and he said, he then said, so he, I said, I said straight, when I presented my dream book, I felt it, uh, I honestly felt it fell, fell flat. And I had one of our advisory board members in the meeting. He felt the same thing. So this guy replies to me saying, he sent this long email and uh, saying, thank you for being so honest. And then he, he opened up. He, he shared some stuff about his life, his journey. And then he shared an old link to an old version of his website, which basically talks in more detail about their culture and how that, that's exactly what we're trying to achieve in a dreams program. So, so we chased our mind. And we're now going ahead with this thing. Wow. You know, so his position, yeah, like you would have walked away. Yeah, we would have walked away. We've never ever done that. Nobody's ever responded like that. Yeah. With such heart. And, was so, and he said, look, Aaron, I'll be honest, one of the challenges is, is that uh, I am, I do keep my, my feelings to myself at times and I do kind of keep my cards close to my chest and I, I loved your openness and authenticity. And, and so through a decline based on culture, he shared a whole lot of stuff. I'm like, wow, this is an amazing thing. And, and he said some other things which just showed how, how moved he was and how keen he was to do this. So we ended up... We're, we're, it's not done, but I would love to do to have them join us on this gym. Talking about authenticity, how comfortable are you doing podcasts about this and self promoting? Because yeah. I was I was interested in your background because I thought you know I hear that you know you you're flying from South Africa to New York, you're doing podcasts, you're doing that. Yeah. You've got to be a self promoter to sort of yeah. grow the business. Is that naturally your personality? Is that authentic to you, or, and, and do you struggle with that? Yeah, I definitely, I definitely do struggle with it, and there's a big piece of it which feels narcissistic, um, and uh, yeah, I kind of, I suppose, as social media has just grown and grown and grown, and you have these people that I think are are just authentic self promoters, and you know, but I even even you know, in the process of 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 embarking on a on a content strategy to to build awareness of what we're trying to do and to connect with more MSP entrepreneurs. I had this inner conflict around, like, am I just see, being seen as one of these sort of shameless self-promoters? It's all just the orange story and that. And it's, you know, so it, it, it's not gone. I have had some discussions with this one friend of mine, Yakub, who kind of said, look, you've got some experience sharing and things that I think are really valuable. You know, I'm a member of Entrepreneurs Organization and, and YPO, and they have this concept called Gestalt, which talks to the idea of sharing experience and not giving advice, which really resonates with me from a values mm -hmm. perspective. So in this journey of, 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 of putting content out there and being engaged in podcasts and that, I try to talk more from experience than trying to give advice because that feels more authentic to me. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely an ongoing debate in my mind whether it's something that I, that I should continue investing time in because I don't want to feel like a narcissist. But I, I've had some feedback and I've had some responses where it seemed like there's some value in what we're sharing and people are learning from it. So, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a constant internal debate <laughs> that I go. Do you enjoy doing it? Do you enjoy them? Or is it, is it nerves kicking at all? Or do you... No, it's, uh, I mean, I've met some unbelievable people, like really, and from all walks of life uh, that are just so interesting. So I've had some absolutely fascinating discussions. So I would say I have enjoyed that uh, piece of it. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and, and I think in the beginning, it definitely took me out of my comfort zone. I was like, I was like very nervous and now I, 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 to be honest, I look forward to these discussions and I've actually really enjoyed it. Yeah, great. Sustainability. This is a topic that's been coming up in the, in the IT community for quite a long time. And when I normally interview smaller companies, they're like, oh, it's not really on their radar. Or when I interview someone from a, a larger company, they're saying, yeah, it's really important. Yeah. ESG is really, really important. For NetSerit, for you personally, 
is sustainability on, on, on your agenda? Do you sort of have that in mind when you're sort of dealing with customers or internally? Yeah. Look, to, to be really honest with you, if you went and looked at our strategy documents and uh, even our SWAT, we're in the middle of our strategic planning right now, it doesn't appear anywhere there. So, you know, it makes me ask myself as a leader, why, why is it not there? Why are you not thinking about that? So I definitely need to go away and think more, how can we make it more of an explicit part of our strategy? I think the one thing I feel proud of that probably does contribute indirectly and in a positive way to this is we used to be very much an in-office culture, okay? We were like 70, 80% and not by a function of demanding it. I don't know, that's just how I'd grown up as an entrepreneur. Even duck in, you know, I would go, if I want to work on Saturday or Sunday, do real work, I would go into the office. That was my thinking. And then in 2020, we just took a very different approach as we saw with the various elements of the pandemic and COVID. And we renegotiated or negotiated out of our, out of our office leases. We sold, we, we used to own a couple of buildings. We sold them and uh, we took a different approach to office space because some of our team in Manhattan, for example, we're doing two hours of commuting a day. Now, what single thing can you do for your people to give them back two hours a day? It's like, that's like a miracle, right? So now we have a work from anywhere dynamic. And uh, I work literally work from anywhere. Work from anywhere. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's been unbelievably positive. I've seen the impact it's had. There's definitely a side to it, Mark, where I think there is a, we've lost some of this, like you and I are sitting here like mm -hmm. this and the connectedness and, uh, and, and I think our, our, our culture in that it has, there's other glue and positive elements that people have leaned more into that because of that. But I definitely think we need to do more of the connectedness. But I think pe less people traveling to the office, less people commuting probably has a, 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 a positive impact on sustainability. But the truth is well, we need to make it a more explicit part of how we show up uh in in as a business and um that'll be one of my takeaways i think i need to go and think about that and come up with a more explicit answer you've been quite honest already about you know your authenticity as a leader and and um maybe like a self-promoter not as it's not as natural to you talking from experience rather than giving advice now you've gone from zero to 380 people have you had to change your leadership style? Have you had to adapt yourself? Yeah. No, uh, I mean, I've had to, uh, in various phases, I've had to let go of all those stuff. So I used to run our South African business. I was the, the key leader. And then I let go to someone else in our team. And then, you know, so there've just been lots and lots of those. And probably over the last year, I've had to let go of a whole lot of uh things uh again do you like that do you like letting go no it was basically <laughs> it's been like i've been uh, i've been uh, unplayable at times you know because i let go and then i see something and i jump back in and i've kind of <laughs> you know i used to i mean i used to be so bad in the early days and it was like it was like war if i walked past i think there were about 10 of us if i walked past a boardroom and there was a meeting i'd be like and i wasn't in it i was like why is there a meeting why don't why you tell me about it? now i'm like the more meetings i'm not in the better you know because it's like there's no ways i could cope so you know i'm i'm trying to i'm trying to protect my balance um i'm trying to as 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 we grow so the only way i'm going to be able to do that and live our purpose of supporting the dreams of doers is if i'm balanced and through that i have to let go so I'm I'm properly challenged, uh, and fortunately, I'm blessed to have amazing people around me who pick up uh, on things and are able to take responsibility. And I remember even I remember sitting in a company meeting back in South Africa in 2018 after I'd moved to New York, and sitting there in person meeting, and I just very clear Brian was doing a better job of running the business than I was, and just realize and I, that's not that I didn't believe they could, but it's just. There are a lot of people in the in our team that are actually much better at these various things than I am. So letting go has definitely helped my sanity. But in the same breath, I've I've lost my temper and not dealt with things well either. And I'm quick to apologize, but you know, it's 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 getting that balance right. But yeah, I'm I'm properly challenged with the pace of growth we're going through right now. And I definitely don't have all the answers. <laughs> Let's, let's talk about growth now. So in 2024, I, I read an, a recent article that mentions 
a minimum of 60% recurring revenue is crucial criteria for you. Yeah. How important is the recurring revenue to growing MSPs in general and your business? Yeah, for sure. No, look, I think, you know, we started down the recurring journey in early 2000, it was 2001. I think we signed our first minute customer. And for me, psychologically, it just felt like a totally different approach. Whereas each year prior to that, I have to think, how much can I sell? How many projects can I do? How many problems can there be in my customer base so that, you know, I can, I can get additional revenue. And so I just felt that the, the annuity the focus was just once the bricks are on the wall, it's on the wall. Then I can build and put another brick on. So it's unbelievably important. It's a key part of our DNA. We're on plus or minus 70% recurring revenue now. And uh, it's a critical part of our strategy and how we want to grow. And we always want it to be values based. So, or value based. We don't want it to be, oh, you're in a contract now and I can't, you know, the customer can't get out. So, um, we actually, what we did is, you know, because if you look at the MSP space, it's a red ocean. Everybody says they're an MSP or an, yeah. a security. So we built a, a, an offering that for now we feel is a blue ocean. We looked at Office 365. We looked at Microsoft Power Platform. And we built an offering around that called Innovate, which basically is for uh, 2,000 pounds a month. Okay. We will find $24,000, 24,000 pounds of ROI in a 12 month period, or we carry on working until we do. And we're looking at automation opportunities, we're looking at adoption opportunities, productivity opportunities, across the Office 365 stack and across the Power Platform stack. And that for us is a value-led annuity engagement, where as the decision maker that has appointed us, you can let go and know that if we're not delivering, we have to carry on until we do. When you are looking at acquisitions in general, you know, when choosing a, a private equity partner, what considerations do you look for when you're sort of choosing to a partner if they've got the right cultural fit? Because there's one thing self-funding, there's one thing going after an acquisition, yeah. and there's one thing trying to get them into the business. But if you look for then a private equity or, or VC in general, yeah, yeah, yeah. what if they're not aligned to your values? No. How, how do you choose them? Yeah, those are huge. Probably the biggest decision I will make in my entrepreneurial life right now is choosing the right private equity partner. Right. Um, and, you know, for me, like, so we are, are, are kicking this off right now, actually. Uh, so the first morning investment bank, then from there, we will fund our private equity partner. I, 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 I absolutely love what I do. And I would love to carry on doing this for a very long time to come. So if I get this choice wrong, that's going to change. Um, so, you know, I, um, I've met with various private equity partners and we actually attended a growth conference in Boston in July where uh, we had about 50 private equity partners that wanted to meet with us and we were, it was only two days so we could meet with about 25. So I had 25 meetings, two days. Oh. And it was it was crazy. So, it, you know, so, so I, I kind of just wanted to ask questions and so forth and then one of the meetings on the second day I thought, you know, fuck it. I'm actually just going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a different tack. So I actually just presented my dream book to this guy in the private equity meeting. And he literally, like, you know, I've, I've got this, <laughs> I've, I've got this, I've got this sort of uh, uh, wrinkle I was furrowing my forehead here from, like, you know, where you can see when I'm more stressed, it's more pronounced. And when I'm le less stressed, it kind of just does this. So I, it was, I just don't know, I felt like I connected with this guy and he came in. This was probably meeting. 20 on the second day <laughs> you know and he came in and we had a little bit of initial chat and then i said you know what? i'm gonna take a different approach and i presented my dream book to him i literally saw his face do this it, it just it just did you know so th i think one of the most important things and we've actually defined a whole criteria in that but for me personally one of the most important things is that you understand the importance of culture in a do they that understand like private equity? Because I, if, if you, if I was a private equity person, uh, you come in with the dream book, I'd be thinking, what are you talking about? Who's, <laughs> who's, who's, who's this to you know, the dream book? I'll be thinking, where's the number? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do, they, they can't, they, they, they can't just. I'm not knocking the, the dream book, but they can't just buy that. They could not because they must be thinking, no, hundred percent. The, the, they're all on about return all the time, aren't they? Yeah, it, it, it has to be there. So this is, this, this is, you know, so what I did is I, I reached out to uh, some friends at Columbia 
and I reached out and they posted on the jobs board and I basically did a note to say, we're looking for some MBA students that could potentially help us with this decision, choosing the right private mm-hmm. equity partner. So we've, we've engaged with one, we're engaging with a second. And it's, um, this is the challenge we have. So if I look at the meetings I have had, from what I can tell, there are definitely some private equity firms that think like this. Without a doubt, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, you know, to dig deeper and really challenge that. You know, the one question I asked many of them is, uh, uh, pretty much all of them, I said, I've never done this before. What questions do you think I should be asked? And the one that came out the most was, speak to the businesses we've invested, okay, or acquired. So that's something I will do. As we get down to a short list of three, I will personally have meetings face-to-face or have discussions with all of those entrepreneurs to get a sense of how did you experience? What was their experience? Yeah, like? yeah. You know, so this is what we have to achieve. The getting it wrong could be disastrous, couldn't it? Totally disastrous. Yeah. yeah. It, it could, it could, the culture should go to it. Totally disastrous. And we have appointed an advisory board member who was the founding leader of uh, at what is now over a $100 million um, uh, MSP platform in the US. And they were acquired by private equity. So we have, we have, we have this experience sharing that he has had that we are learning for and we will continue to learn. So in the year ahead, it's one of the most important decisions I will make because, you know, what dawned on me here is that that is so exciting and just taking the meaning of what we're doing to the next level. There are, there are about 20,000 MSPs in the US alone. 20,000? 20, about 20,000. And I, we have this opportunity to, to, to create, in, I believe, one of the best in class MSP platforms and provide a next chapter for so many of these MSPs and their people that is deeply people focused, that is purpose driven, uh, while still achieving the numbers. I really think that's possible. So I just, I have this next phase of, of meaning and purpose, which I'm so excited about. And if we find the right private equity partner, I believe we can achieve something truly, truly great. My last question, Oren. In 2024, you know, we've talked about, you know, expansion, culture, private equity, mergers, acquisitions. For you personally, what, what, what's the plan for, for the business and for you, 2024? And I don't, you don't have to give me a dream ball. You don't have to tell me all of it. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, I'm going to get a powerful impression to you. I was with you. I was with you. Yeah. No, so I, I think in summary, we want to. We're going to. The, the goal is to choose a private equity partner, mm-hmm. which is which is very significant. Um, to protect our culture and the quality of service that we deliver to our customers. To deeply embrace, and we've done some really cool things as well already. I, 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 in the way we run the business internally and what we can automate and to make it a, a key pillar of our innovate offering into our customers um those are those are those are the key things key things we are we're we're focused on in the year ahead look if i look at our strategy culture and our people is number one that's the thing that i'm going to be leaning into even more than we do currently because i think it's the it's the single strategy and 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 the Harley, isn't it? In there, yes, the Harley and company. Yeah, Oren, you've been a great guest. Thanks, Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you, Mark.